absolutely. Are you rec you recording? That's lovely. I'm just, I've, there we are. I've hit record now. Dr. Gareth Sherwood, you're the chairman for today. That's fantastic for this last epic <coughs> forum in the series. And we're in your very capable hands, Gareth. Bless you. Um, so it's lovely to see you all. Thank you for popping along. And thank you for the time given from the panel members. Um, today's session, um, we're going to be looking at the stop and search and the ethics of, of stop and search uh, with a particular emphasis on um, any identifiable unconscious bias that may be going on behind the scenes as well with part of the stop, stop and search and how that introduces all sorts of challenges to the practical and the ethical aspects of stop and search. So today we've got um, uh, Inspector Danny Tamblin with us, and we've got Russell Slatford with us, uh, Chris Norton, Louise Hall, and I, I believe we've got one other coming along. Um, and so, um, so what I'm going to do is just uh, introduce Danny Tamblin to us because he's the first one on my screen um, at, at the top there. And um, Danny, just in the introduction of this topic, have you got any opening remarks about this topic and something you would like to say? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you ever so much for having me once again. It's always a, a real pleasure being on these forums. Um, so uh, I'm currently the neighbourhood police inspector from uh, North Bournemouth. Uh, it's an area that encompasses the, encompasses the university. So uh, stop and search uh, and the effect it has on our communities generally is, is something that's of real interest to me, just personally and professionally. Um, in my previous roles within the police, I was a personal safety trainer for 20 years, so I, I had spent a lot of time teaching stop and search tactics to police officers, uh, and I'm currently one of the stop and search leads for the force. So I've, I've got a real interest in in uh, the effect stop and search has in making our community safer, the um, the communication and ongoing impact it has with our communities, uh, and linking that into legitimacy about how that is perceived by uh, members of the public. In, in terms of opening comments about stop and search, I think the, the, the key focus I would like to have, um, because stop and search is a real multifaceted issue, there's a lot going on, there's no simple uh, solution to the, the challenges faced by crime or stop and search as a, a tool to, to tackle it, is to keep in mind what we want to achieve by uh, the, the provision of a police service within our society, uh, and where that focuses on making public safer, and where that focuses on detecting and reducing crime, uh, what we want our police service to achieve and your police service to achieve through the use of stop and search. And there will always be challenges within policing. Uh, we talk about policing by public consent, but there's never going to be 100% of the public that consent to 100% of what we do. And I think the, the, the challenges that we, our colleagues even Somerset have faced in Bristol have shown that. Um, but what is it that the vast majority of public want us to legitimately achieve in law enforcement and stop and search and then the, the pitfalls that surround that will hopefully be brought out this afternoon apologies my video froze there so i'm now back um so thank you very much danny bless your heart um louise hall if you wouldn't mind um being being next would you like to introduce yourself and then uh, open your remarks yes hi everyone i'm louise hall my pronouns are she her so i'm currently the president of arts university at bournemouth su um as a person of color and kind of i find it really interesting to talk about stop and search and have this space to kind of talk about the lived experience and the knock-on effects but also what we can do as a society and a system to kind of really challenge it and make it a safer place for all the individuals involved. Thank you very much. Bless you. Um, and Kate, and, and over to Russell, Russell Slatford, um, who is next on the panel. Again, Russell, would you like to introduce yourself and then any opening remarks that you have? Thank you, Gareth. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, it's lovely to see some familiar faces from the, the time I did this. Gosh, it's probably a couple of months ago now, Ian, I think, uh, when I was last on. I feel I need to do something with my background um, to start with. I was looking at Louise's wonderfully kind of colourful and vibrant background and thinking I must make more of an effort. And I always feel as an educator, I should have a, a bookcase. That kind of seems to be the go-to, doesn't it? I can see a few people nodding. Uh, look, I am absolutely delighted uh, to be back uh, talking to you. Um, what an incredibly, I mean, I know it's on the basis of, of stop and search, but what an incredibly uh, important and um, I think kind of dynamic discussion <clears throat> about um, the principle of kind of unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. And of course, particularly for, in my background, I'm a, a teacher, educator, head teacher, 
I've been working in schools for 20 odd years. I have the, the privilege of being the headmaster at a, at a local school. We have little ones um, from two all the way up to, to 18, uh, 640, 650 of them. Uh, and of course, a lot of what we do uh, in our, I hope in our normal kind of educational environment is all about talking about respect and tolerance and prejudice and how young people learn, and I think it is learned, um, to interact with each other in, in, the, in an appropriate and the right way. I think there's a wonderful discussion, we, I doubt we'll have time, where we look at nature and nurture, um, because I'm, uh, a bias is about, um, for, for many, about being, in its kind of, I suppose, simplistic terms, it's about being comfortable. You know, people being around people who share similar views, and, and that is, in, in that regard, a very right and a very appropriate thing. Where, though, it becomes intolerant, and, we, and that bias leads to assumptions and judgments, then of course it becomes a different matter. So it's a discussion point in schools all the time. And of course, having that discussion with a five, six year old is a very entertaining and interesting discussion. And it becomes a very different discussion and an education where you're talking about uh, perhaps adolescence, talking about relationships. Um, and as Danny said, obviously the stop and search is, is, a, is a part and a very interesting part and perhaps a really good catalyst to start this important discussion. And I'm delighted that I've been asked to, to, to share my thoughts on it. And thank you, Gareth, uh, for uh, chairing this today. Bless you, that's very kind. Um, so there's some very short summaries to open up. Uh, at, at this point in the meeting, normally we would have a contribution from the final panelists, but I don't think Chris Norton has been able to join, join us yet. So what I will now do is open it up to the floor. And if you could indicate either by raising your hand digitally or in real on your camera, <laughs> I will I'll find you and um, you can address some questions to the, the panel and we'll go panel one by one on that when, uh, when we're able to. So has anybody got any questions they wish to ask the panel at this point? I always have questions. So if you don't have any, I'll, I'll fire the first one. There is that, Sue, you have your- <laughs> Always. <laughs> but it's not questions. We've had a lot of crime lately in Southampton, um, especially in the area that I live in, with young people with knives, um, intimidating other young people, um, actually using knives um, and threatening with knives um, and other things besides knives, um, car levers and that sort of thing. Um, in that respect, I, I really do think that stop and search is good. But the trouble is, how do you get the police to do it when there isn't enough police to go around? <laughs> because uh, you never, we used to have a police station in Shirley. We haven't got one anymore. And we just never see a policeman walking. Um, and the young people are just getting away almost with murder. We've had some ser very serious injuries from knife crime. You know, so if there was a chance of stop and search, I'm sure we wouldn't quite have quite so much, but I'll throw it out to your thoughts. So uh, I'll, I'll probably bring in the, the, the inspector to begin with. Uh, bless you, Danny, you're first in. Um, would you like to kind of pass an initial comment on that? And then we'll go to Louise after that and then Russell, just so you know what's coming next. Absolutely. Uh, Sue, thank you for the question. And I'm sorry that uh, it's clearly a concern for you. It's, it's a concern for me as well as, as a you know, a local neighbourhood inspector, but also as, as a parent as well. I don't want um, people with knives on the street. Um, again, th this is a complex issue. So if we, if we look at the, the policing numbers side of it, um, does having less police officers have an effect on our ability to make people safer and feel safer? Yes, uh, no doubt whatsoever. Um, I think this in terms of simple economics, if um, if you're at a till at Tesco's and other supermarkets are available, the more tills are open, the faster they will deal with the queues. Uh, the less tills are open, the longer your wait's going to be. So I think there's a direct correlation there, although that's rather oversimplified, I appreciate. Um, stop and search can be a very, very useful tactic. We have to be mindful, I think, about a couple of things. One, how we apply it, where and when we apply it. Uh, but also, I think we have to consider um, what we define as success. So more often than not, success with stop and search is 
defined in terms of whether we find the item we're looking for, which is most commonly a weapon or drugs or something similar. Um, there are certain consequences as a result of stop and search where uh, deterrent factor is there, where people don't want to be stopped and searched. So where there's an increase in that tactic, people will uh, displace their activity because it's more difficult for them. There's also the consideration of vulnerability that many, and it's not just young people, but it is predominantly young people that are involved in um, a lot of this activity. Many of them are victims as well, who have been forced into a set of circumstances by coercion, um, arguably, arguably by a consistent failure to um, intervene in their circumstances throughout their childhood. And whilst they are dangerous individuals committing crime, they're also victims. Stop and Search has an opportunity for us to uh, identify them as victims and um, put in place uh, interactions and opportunities to try and get them out of that criminal criminality and safeguard them. So I'd say, is Stop and Search a, a useful tactic is, in the circumstance you described, Sue? Yes, but it has to be intelligently applied. Thank you, Danny. Um, Louise? Yes, um, I was going to say thank you, Sue, for the question. I think touching on what Danny says, it's how do we use stop and search correctly? And we know kind of there's almost conflating the issue of stop and search and who we are keep on most likely to be stopping and searching. So is there a number of individuals that feel like they're the ones continu continually being targeted by stop and search? And we know actually a black men feel targeted by this and not necessarily um, just in Dorset, but as a national picture, we know that actually the stats for them are higher. So how do we use Stop and Search as a tool to keep the community safe, but without targeting a, a singular community and demonizing them continually to be the ones that, oh, they must be carrying knives on, they must be acting as criminals because then it puts in that behavior of, oh, that's what's expected. That's what society sees us as. And that's a negative cycle that we, that we really need to break down. We, we can use that in education to really understand those thought processes and break it down. It's linking to how we see each other in society. And I think part of Stop and Search is clearly part of a wider issue of how we treat people from uh, black backgrounds in society. And thinking going on of like, how, how else would you suggest fixing that, that issue? If you're seeing a rate, uh, height in crime how else can we put things in place is it actually if it's mainly people that are young are we needing to open more youth centers to keep them proactively busy giving them more um, things to get involved with giving them more opportunities is that kind of where we can improve it as a as a community but as a society as well that's lovely thank you um as someone that runs ymcas and youth centers i'm wholly behind opening more of those so uh, <laughs> Um, uh, Russell, would you like to come in and, and with any comments that you have? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I've actually got questions, and I don't, I don't want to put Danny on the spot uh, at all, but I'm, I'm interested. But Danny, you, you mentioned at the, uh, the start about training uh, around stop and search, and I, I suppose I had two questions. Do, do you think there is a bias around the principle of stop and search? Because that's fundamentally what we're talking about today. And do you think that the discussion that's clearly now out there about unconscious bias, the fact that we're now conscious of it, do you think it now it has become, um, you know, a, a, if you like, a, 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 at least around the stop and search, a kind of a fairer process? And I hope those questions about, I don't want to put Danny on the spot, but I, I, I'm really interested around, you know, this, this kind of principle of bias. Because I think, as Louise was saying, that that is the perception in in some, you know, certainly the press will give us that um, outcome. And of course, I think Danny's obviously the training and, and you, with your background will know that actually, you know, yes, perhaps there was an issue, but actually the training has been updated. And now that is not like that. So I'd be interested, Danny, if you're happy to comment. No, I don't feel put on the spot at all by that, Russell. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, no, that, that's a brilliant question, all seriousness. And um, I think you, you've you kind of hit on the six million dollar question then so it, do i think there's bias um the police service is um is encompassed of or supposed to be encompassed of a representation of the society it serves which means we should have uh, male female uh, black white etc and you know gay straight um 
all the way through our, um, um, our service. And we don't do too bad a job with that. However, it also means as, as alongside all the good stuff, we get the bad stuff. So we are going to get officers who potentially are um, are prejudiced or biased in certain areas. So I think that it would be it would be, be foolish of me to say that no police officers have bias. I think there's also an element of exposure, which makes officers biased. And sometimes that can be quite a good thing uh, in terms of the, the, the copper's nose, the copper's nose, the ability for a police officer to recognize when someone's in danger or someone's committing a crime. There's something to be said for that. Uh, that arguably is bias. It's how you apply that that's a difficult bit. Unconscious bias is a real challenge because it's very, um, of its time at the moment, it's very, very popular. There is at this time very little uh, strong evidence base to support that you can uncover unconscious bias and do something about it. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And certainly Dorset Police are committed at this time to investigating unconscious bias. And with, you know, with some academic work to try and figure out, is that the case? How do we identify it? How do we do something about it? Um, in terms of uh, whether that bias affects day-to-day -day policing, um, one of the things that Louise touched on it is the, the stats. Um, you can get an indication of the stats. Now, just to put things in perspective, the stats that we're working on are the last census data. So um, we know for a fact that at least the, the ethnic population of Dorset has at least doubled. I think there's four, um, four times as many BME children in Dorset schools as there were during the last census. Um, so we have to be mindful about the, the figures, if you like. They're, they're the best indication, they're not the most in accurate indication. You are way more likely to be stopped, or we stop way more white people white males than anybody in Dorset by a long way. The last point you made in relation to the media, I think is key because the media are for good or ill, a key part in the communication that we have from the police to the public. So if you look at Dorset police's disproportionality rate based on um, the number of uh, BME individuals that live in Dorset and are searched, uh, the disproportionality figure is 28 to one approximately, which is really high and uh, not something that um, we would wish for. However, I would also point out that the disproportionality rate in the Perbex is 64 to one. That was based on two black males being stopped in a year. So if you think of it in terms of Dorset, you are thinking of it in the same way as if you taught, uh, treated the entire country like London. If you took London away, the statistics for um, BME population statistics, statistics for anything would be you know, monetary value would be very different because London is an outlier there. So we are now looking at academic work to uncover unconscious bias, but also a postcode system of where searches are taking place. So they, those statistics are based on per thousand people. So there are way more white people being searched than any other ethnicity. And the last point I think I'd make in relation to that, um, the statistics are there to, or the, the use of the statistics nationally is to decide how we are employing stop and search on our communities. A very large percentage of people that we stop and search are not part of the Dorset community. They are people who are visiting the Dorset community for various reasons. Um, and that includes to commit criminality by county lines and to deal drugs to our vulnerable people. Um, if they are stopped and searched, they make the statistics, but they are not Dorset um, individuals. Um, and in terms of the impact that we have on our communities, I don't think there's anybody of any background that wants us to take, not to take proactive action uh, in an appropriate fashion to stop their communities being affected by drugs and related crime. That's very helpful. Thank you, Danny. Um, I'm gonna bring in um, Father Andrew Ragstaff now, who's had his hand up and has been patiently waiting with the patience of a saint. Um, for the last 10 minutes with his hand up. The only thing about me that's got anything to do with the saint, I think. Um, <laughs> I, I'd, I'd like the panellists, if, if, I, if I could invite you just to break it down to the very most basic practical ethical um, question. So if we take a, a, a police officer, what are the questions that a police officer should have in mind <laughs> when he or she is considering stopping and searching someone. And, I, and these could be objective questions about the person they're thinking about, or it could be subjective questions about themselves, but what questions should they have in mind? Very helpful. Now, uh, rather controversially, I'm gonna to go to Louise first and we come to Danny last. So, um, so Louise, what questions should an officer have in mind? 
I think the kind of the questions when approaching a situation is obviously, I, I can, also I'm not a police officer, but thinking actually what, what else is going on in the situation? What is the picture that we're seeing? But also how do we approach this individual without committing microaggressions? How do we think about all the different lived experiences that this person might have had? And also their reaction to the police officer, depending on their mental state, who they are, their different lived experiences, they might not react positively even if they're innocent or guilty, they will. They might go, oh, this is a really scary situation. How will they react? So thinking, actually, this person might not feel comfortable. How can we make them feel comfortable when we're, we're asking them a question, even if it's just like, oh, did you drop that litter? How do you, how do you broach that? And I think it's, how do we use sensitivity training and how do we train ourselves to register the microaggressions we're committing, register kind of, unconscious bias as much as we can realizing the journey of allyship that we're all on to really address when we speak to different people from especially different marginalized groups that maybe isn't our own lived experience and how we in our uniform can present to other people from the community that's very helpful thank you russell would you like to come in on that gosh what a what a question um andrew um we're making, I mean, I suppose the way I look at it is we're, I mean, we're, we're, you're talking about it from a, a specific situation, but we're making judgments um, and, and decisions all the time. And you know, from you know, when to do things, how to do things, how to talk to people, tone. Um, and we learn, I mean, my role is teaching young people and they learn as they get older about um, I suppose the appropriateness of their words and their actions in different situations. It is a learnt uh, skill and it comes, I mean, this is where I think it comes very interestingly from the nature nurture, you know, they will live in family environments and be shaped by their parents in the first few years where teachers don't have that ability. Um, in the situation you're, you uh, raise, Surely the, the only question really, at least around the topic that we're talking about, is why is that person being stopped for stop and search? And ultimately, if, if it is because the police officer has objective reason and bringing in Danny's uh, copper's nose as well, I mean, experience, we all base our judgments on the experience we've had. And, and it's about why am I am I stopping that person? And what are the reasons behind it? Because as Louise was saying, if the reasons behind that are not linked to suspicion or, you know, yeah. uh, the, the potential inappropriate or actions or, you know, something suspicious, you know, a, a car in the neighborhood at, the, at that time of the day, I mean, I'm not a police officer, as you can tell by my slightly mumbled answer. Um, but if the reasons that, was, that, that, that that police officers made that stop and search are for good objective reason and ultimately that they could then justify if they were asked then that is fine and it helps you know to, to pick up on Sue's point about helping I think we would all agree keeping our community safer but if the reason for the stop and search is not in that way and it is because of the color of the person's skin then that is not the right reason and that in my mind is the only question that should be asked. It's very helpful. Thank you. And, and Danny, coming to you, the, the reason I asked for you to go last is because I thought you would be interested in being able to comment on both the previous answers at the same time as filling us in on, on some of the details that you know from, from operations. No, thank you. Um, and I, say, I agree with everything that uh, Louise and Russell have said. Um, at Louise's point, without oversimplifying it, taking into consideration the totality of the situation, so everything that's going on. Um, and then uh, Russell's point, uh, Louise also made about objectivity. So uh, the use of stop and search is, is closely um, closely governed by legislation and codes of practice. So the, the officer searching would have to have an objective basis. So uh, if they had imaginary people on their shoulder who took the same information as you, would they have probably gone to, the, to make the same decision as you did? Um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but every stop and search that takes place in Dorset is recorded, video recorded by Body One Video. Uh, that Body One Video is, is kept on a, a central system and a, a form is is uh, recorded every time a stop and search uh, occurs uh, where the officer would have to justify their grounds. 
Each one of those um, forms is scrutinized. They're made available uh, independently via our PCC's office and via the independent scrutiny panel who will dip check and sample those stop checks and the body worn video to see if they feel from their objective basis that based on the information available to them, would they have conducted the same search? Um, there are various reasons why a police officer would conduct a stop search. Sometimes it's based on intelligence, uh, i.e. We have information that the occupants of a certain vehicle are involved in certain criminality. Um, and that could be that they're stopped by armed officers because they think they have firearms, or it could be drugs, or it could be weapons. It, quite often, it is based on um, members of the public. So a member of the public will call us and say, I've just seen a person matching a certain description committing a certain act. Uh, and that would potentially give us grounds. That's the only time where the color of the skin would be relevant. If, if they said, for example, I've seen three white males standing on a street corner dressed in the following clothing, dealing drugs as an example, if the police officer turned up and saw three white males wearing those clothing in that general location, that might well give them grounds to stop and search that person. And the other common area would be if the police officer themselves self-generates that action, where they see a member of the public doing something which they have reasonable grounds to suspect, makes them think, hang on a second, I think this person could be committing a crime that would justify me searching them. Uh, the purpose of a search is to try and confirm or allay those suspicions. I think you might have a weapon on you, I've searched you, no you don't. Or I think you might have a weapon on you, I've searched you, yes you do, that will then lead to arrest. Uh, but just to, just to clarify those points, that absolutely it's got to be objective, uh, it's got to be taken into the totality, but the final thing I'd, I'd say in relation to that is as part of that totality, the lived experience of the police officer is also relevant and their human rights are also relevant. Um, they are placing themselves in harm's way by getting close to a member of the public who may respond badly to them. Uh, and as much as we, communication is absolutely key here and that's a two way process. Uh, so we do need to listen as much as we project. Um, but ultimately, stop and search is the application of a power. And the person doesn't have a choice whether that power is enacted upon them. So that gives us a massive amount of responsibility in how we do it. But the difficult part is if the person says, I don't want to be searched, the end result will be, if appropriate, they will be searched. And unfortunately, that sometimes results in force having to be used. That's when it gets particularly challenging. Thank you, Danny. Um, th there is a question in the chat about does everybody feel safer with more police? Um, but that's more of a, a question to the general group. So show of hands if everybody does. Uh, one, one, two, three. I, I generally feel a bit safer with police officers around, but then that's because my experience has been very good. And I have um, friends and young people that I've looked after over many years and some of them don't. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, it's a lot of that's down to experience. Um, are there any other questions? There, there are. D David, you have your hand up, sir. I, I invite you to, to ask a question. Sorry, it wasn't a question so much, um, but a reaction to that uh, show of hands. Uh, we lived in a predominantly multi, in a very multiracial community and um, white people, by and large, trust the police. It's interesting that um, the question originally was simply young people, not of any particular colour. I don't know the background in Southampton. Um, there were mostly white children, white youngsters that have been uh, doing crimes. Yeah. So it's drifted from that into the colour question, which is very... Um, but uh, the point I was going to make is that uh, white people feel comfortable with police around. My experience of the, it was quite shocking to find out in the black community of which I was part, that the parents advised their children, six, 10, whatever age, that if they got lost, for instance, or whatever, you stay clear of the police. You did not go be to the police because you did not trust them. And I think from that experience too, that stop and search is actually, um, yes, as uh, Danny said, it's a power imbalance, you're using it. So you are actually erecting a barrier. Um, and if the distrust is already there, and this is with everybody, young people, any color, whatever, if the distrust is already there, you're actually increasing that. Um, sense of difference, shall I say. Okay, so so perhaps if I can build on what David has said and put it into a question, it would be that there is clearly um, some framework of statistics around um, a bias 
and potentially unconscious bias that's going on. There's also the challenges of bringing in um, the stop and search. But David's question revolving around how would we address this and build trust? Um, so is there a question which I can post to the panel? I'll, I'll invite Russell to go first this time, where we can, um, we can potentially build trust and understanding and in the context of still needing stop and search. And any comment about um, the challenges or the, the possible answers to how we manage trust um, between community groups and ethnic, ethnic groups? And the police. Uh, I mean, uh, a, a big, a big question there, Gareth, uh, for sure. Um, I mean, we are, as human beings, attracted, are we not, to uh, other people who share our interests, who share our values, um, who think like we do, and I, and I guess, you know, uh, in some situations, who look like we do. It, it, it has always been. Thus, and I think it, it will be, the communities that we live in, the, the families that we grow up in shape our views. The, the important thing in my mind, and you know, we're in the school that, that I'm uh, privileged enough to be responsible for, is about uh, developing a sense of, I suppose, community, respect, tolerance, you know, young people struggle with difference. You know, we, we, if we, I'm sure many of uh, us uh, on this call have got children, and we know uh, from Ian's picture at the beginning, grandchildren. And it, for young people, it's all, it, and indeed adults, it's all about, I think, being accepted, being part of something. Um, you know, the the young people, it's about making friends and and having that group of friends. Um, but within that, it is having a respect for those people who, and um, a, an ability to pause, sympathize, empathize, um, appreciate that difference, difference of opinion, difference of interest, difference of race, difference of ethnicity is, uh, in young people this is, is about um, understanding that, that the world that they've lived in up until that point is different. That doesn't necessarily come naturally to them because the world they've grown up in will often be quite narrow. You know, I think parents uh, have a great deal to, to do in shaping uh, those views and that, if you like, tolerance and respect. And, you know, it is very interesting. Um, you know, I, I don't want to digress particularly around because we're not talking about things like kind of vaccination programs and those kind of things. But it's been, I find it really fascinating talking to some parents around um, you know, self-isolation, school sending pupils home, getting testing, getting vaccinated. And parents have got a very, very, very fixed mindset about something like that. And talking to them and trying to you know, adjust temper, uh, change opinion is very, very hard. And it's, it, it, when it happens, it, even now, and I've been in the, this profession for many years, I, it surprises me. That, that in the world that we live in, where we are bombarded with such kind of varieties of views and that there isn't this kind of acceptance that there is another opinion and there is another way to look at things. Um, and it surprises me. And, and, and to be honest, saddens me at times when I get things back from, from parents, but it then explains to some degree why, why there is a, a kind of fixed view uh, in, for a number of you know, views of uh, of the world. I mean, we do a lot of work around what we call, and I know it's a common phrase now, but growth mindset in young people. This sense of being able to kind of go, this is what it's presented to me, but there is another way. And there is another way of looking at it. There is another way of behaving. There is another way of responding. There is another way of viewing the situation. And I think, you know, we there's an education for us as teachers and in schools to the young people, but actually to our communities and to the parents. And I, in many ways, that's the harder bit. We have an opportunity to shape young people more so than we have to shape the parents who have such an influence over the views that their children hold. Thank you, that's a, that's a very interesting insight there, Russell. Thank you so much. We're, we're gonna go to Danny then next, and then to Louise for the final word on, on, on the topic of trust building. Um, so Danny, would you have any comments about that? Yes, it links to the previous point. It's, it's a real challenge. It's, it's a big part of this communication. Uh, it's a big part of it is um, 
certainly from the police perspective, is listening. Because uh, I think we, we've always, as an organisation, been on transmit quite a lot um, and perhaps <laughs> need to be on receive quite a bit. And without stepping aside this, so Louise, I'd, I'd love the opportunity to speak to you offline um, as, uh, as kind of your representative for a uh, arts university to, to see if I can be a better service to you. And I think that you know, this, this kind of interaction is, is really valuable because you said, I, I don't have your lived experience at all. Um, and I can't understand it or, or have an appreciation of it unless we have conversations. So I'm really grateful for these, these kind of opportunities. I think um, we can perpetuate th this, this distrust very easily. As long as p parents keep telling them their kids that the police should be trusted and as long as the police keep telling each other that these xyz kind of individuals are more likely to be involved in crime that that will will continue um i can only speak from my lived experience having been a police officer in dorset for nearly 24 years now um 99.9 .9 of police officers male female uh, and everything in between are really good people um, i've worked with police officers of um uh, many ethnicities um what draws us together as a community is the the belief in um honestly the nobility of service uh to service to all our communities to run towards danger on behalf of our communities and and to do the right thing to serve our communities uh do we get it wrong sometimes yeah absolutely we certainly do uh, but your average individual officer has got no inclination whatsoever to be um inappropriate with their powers inappropriate with their with their comments uh, could we do better Absolutely. Uh, but I think uh, trust has to be that two way process where, whereby the police do their bit. But society and we're, ju we're, we're just members of the public in uniform. Everyone's got to play their part. It can't be a, an imbalanced process. Otherwise, uh, I don't think we're going to get um, the two way communication that the trust uh, requires to develop. Thank you, Danny. Uh, Louise. Thank you. Yeah, just to touch on what has already previously been said, but we talk a lot about trust and building trust, but actually I think to start, we need to understand why there is such a big distrust and the different lived experiences that we do have. And I'm, I'm happy to share my own as, as a person of colour. Um, I'm mixed race, so my mum is white, my, my dad is from the Caribbean, he's from Jamaica, so I've, I have that joint kind of lived experience of two different, two different continents. And it is about, again, talking about the power balances in society and how people of colour are seen in society. But for me, it was never explicitly said I should be scared of the police. I inherently am scared of the police when police walk past me in case they they decide that I have, I'm doing something wrong because of the, the skin tone. And I think it also comes into place of people move around across the country. And me as a student, I came from near North London to, to Downham Dorset. That's a very different experience of a policing, but also society, also the conversations that may be being had. My schooling was very different to down, potentially some of the schools down here. And that all plays a part in kind of how I've grown up but I think that there needs to be that understanding of actually, as you said, there's different lived experiences and that where does the distrust start? Is it as what we see in the media, how we see officers on the street, everyone is a different individual. Everyone has a different story and we can't blanket state everyone, but it's how we break that down. And what else are we seeing in that conversation? And we're seeing a lot in the media at the moment about distrust of the police, especially from being a woman and where we stand as being women and do we feel safe and do we feel protected? So all of this kind of comes into that consciousness of actually, if I'm walking home, can I trust a police officer? Can I have that conversation? Do you think actually, if there's an issue, can I call them? Or are we in the position that I have been before where I don't necessarily feel safe or I don't feel like if I did report something to police, I would be listened to or it would actually be listened to or understood because actually the majority of the police force that I've encountered haven't looked like me or sounded like me and that's not negative but that's kind of the lived experience I've grown up with and try to understand and as you say you know police need to keep people safe and how do we keep people safe and how do we build up that trust and thinking of the breakdown of power that we see in society and the, the colonial legacy we still have in place how does that work <clears throat> with things like the police force and um, other kind of public services and how can we change that narrative to make everyone feel safe and included so people like me can call the police if there's an issue and that we don't feel like we're going to be the people that are going to be accused of being the perpetrators instead of the victims which is often the case like you, you go and you're like oh well I'm being accused of something I'm calling for so how do we have that conversation have these narratives and spaces like this is really important to break down those conversations and, and speak about it and thinking okay so where do we go from here is 
the awareness of what we're feeling and how we're feeling it and where we can go and building those bridges of community and trust. And I think that's how we kind of change the conversation and improve the situation for all the different lived experiences um, in that terms. Thank you so much, Louise, bless you. Uh, have we got any other questions from, uh, from those in attendance, anyone? I have 30,000, but I don't like asking all my questions. Andrew Wagstaff, Father Andrew Wagstaff, after you, sir. I, I have already asked a question, but there's just something else that um, I was interested in. Um, looking at the news and, and, and the way that people are um, reacting to, to, to policing at the moment, it feels to me a little bit like the earliest days of policing must have felt when um, it was a new idea in, in the early 19th century and there was a lot of pushback from, from white people actually who felt that this was a, a foreign idea. Policing was, a, was, a, was an idea which came from um, the continent from Napoleonic France and didn't have any place in England. Um, and there had to be a, rig, a big reset under Robert Peel and an, uh, a sort of consensus built up um, uh, around what policing was. Um, and if that's happening again now, can I ask the panel, each, each, each person, just to say what they would like to see as part of that reset, if it's going to happen? Thank you, Andrew. Um, going back through the, the the sequence that I had at the beginning, it'll be Danny, then Louise, then Russell. So Danny, after you. So I, I think um, so the, the, the police service have a huge part to play, play in that. We can't ignore the, the challenges. Um, it, it's interesting you know, what you said about that, Andrew, that you know, when we, the, the police first came around, there was no plainclothes department. There was no... Um, detective agency for like no CID because we wanted to make sure that we we're seen as being citizens in uniform and not like a secret police as such. Um, we have to be mindful that the, the, the lived experience of people just changes, our communities change. It's overall asking, you know, a hundred white heterosexual males all think the police do a great job. We, we've kind of missed the point if, if that is um, the, the audience that we, um, the audience that we, we approach. And for my money, um, I think, we all, everybody involved needs to be open to criticism. It needs to be open to uh, different thoughts, different mindsets um, and, and listen, listen for facts, not just feelings. And what I mean by that is in my personal view, and it probably mirrors my professional view, I think the media have a significant role to play in this. Um, I think, you know, the, the newspapers don't sell if there's good news in it. But there's an awful lot of good things that happen, an awful lot of amazing acts by all kinds of people. No one's interested. We want to hear about the bad stuff. Um, we want to see that of the the, the ten minute in, incident that the police were involved in, I'm going to play the 15 seconds that paint the police in the worst light because that's going to create news bites. Um, you know, in terms, you reference the the concern that some women have for their safety, um, and, and that is a huge concern for us. That is a huge concern for me as a um, as a father of a little girl, and as a huge concern for me as a, a, a husband. Um, statistically, um, you are way, way more likely to be a victim of violence if you're a male by a long way. Three out of four suicides are all committed by males. I say committed, apologies. Uh, it's three out of four males um, will, will commit, well, apologies. I, I'm stuck with that, that phrase in my head. Uh, please forgive that it's not an accusatory nature that the, the word committed. Um, but that's not to say there's not an issue with, with female officers, but excuse me, female um, concerns. Um, but we have to, I think, keep everything in, in a perspective uh, and be honest with the data and use it both ways. So if someone would, would critique, as for example, critique the police based on data, um, if the data gives a certain message, I don't think we can then say, oh uh, yeah, but that, I'm not sure the data is correct there. Uh, the communities can't have it both ways for want of a better phrase. Thank you, Danny. That's that's very good. Thank you. Um, Louise, would you like to comment as well? Yeah, I was just also going to touch on what Danny said about um, actually women and their experience with the police. It's not just, you know, violent crimes, it is sexual assault. And we know 97% of young women have been a victim of sexual harassment or sexual assault. And having that conversation of actually, we know 
um, that that is a lived experience, how do we amplify that? And I think that brings on to my answer is actually, what can we reform and how can we reform? I think it's lived experience at the center of our conversations, at the center of how we please, how do we train? How do we have those conversations? How do we teach others about a lived experience that isn't their own? Do we create reading collectors within the force so they have those tools to proactively carry on that, that journey of allyship that we've mentioned before? <clears throat> like, do we kind of go around what is, inclusion and diversity, what does that mean for the police force with the policies that they're putting in place and also the policies that are then around policing that go to government, how do the police support them or not support them and how does that support the citizens that they, they're looking after and under their protection. So I think it, it needs to be that the policy making is influenced by all the people in the communities and all the different voices and not just the majority which it is at the moment, there's lots of different voices that aren't being heard and how do we put them in that space? And I'm really aware that I'm here talking about my experience, but actually the experience for me is very different from my brother and his experience being a black male. So they're really different voices to be heard and make sure we're amplifying them. And I think that's how we can make real change within the force. Thank you, Louise, that's very helpful. Uh, Russell. Thank you, uh, Gareth. Um, it's a, I, I was thinking about the question and I'm, I'm not sure if I've, completely understood it. I, I'd understood it to be about kind of resetting the kind of kind of the police following um, matters in Bristol and other areas in the last couple of weeks. Is that, have I understood that correctly, Andrew? Is that? So, yes, Russell, yeah. I mean, so the, part of what Parliament's debating at the moment is whether to give the police more powers, but what I'm really asking is, is do we need to examine um, the whole basis of policing, um, yeah. okay. the relationship between police and public? Yeah, I think um, what I would say about that is, and I think you, you've, I mean, I think Louise and Danny have, have referenced this, and in fact, you, you have as well, Andrew, about one of the things that's really struck me about life and society at the moment is, you know, we're, we're living in a global pandemic. We're living in these extraordinary times and we've got, uh, and whether, whether you love or loathe the current government and you agree or disagree with the decisions they've made and are making, they're making decisions and they're making decisions very quickly um, and, and uh, requiring us as people in the society to act upon those decisions. And there was obviously, I mean, Cressida Dick was on, I think it's probably, what, 10 days ago now, talking about, obviously, the aftermath of, of that protest. And it seemed to me that it was a very difficult situation for absolutely everybody involved, that the right to protest, the right to, to speak up about these issues, absolutely, in an environment where we're trying to keep people apart because we want to keep people safe and we don't want large gatherings. And the government has set a, a, a legal precedent on that and it ends up going through the, uh, the, uh, the judiciary in a very, as far as I could tell, very speedy manner to get some form of outcome that, that the, the police and the protesters can act upon. And I think if I recall, some of the protesters in that situation actually said, we're not going to do what we were gonna do. And, and I guess for me, I mean, we see it in such a minor way in school, but we have, we have the same you know, situation. We, we broke up in December to be told two days after we break up that we're going to have to do mass testing on return in January. We spent most of our Christmas holidays as teaching staff getting medical centres set up in our schools to find that we were then delaying that decision. And, and, I, and I'm not critical of the government at all because, my goodness me, we're trying to manage things in such a frantic way. But I think, we, you know, in the same way that we're talking about bias, we've got to have a tolerance to the situation that we are in. Normally, you know, we have an opportunity to, to sit down and I hope as a country, generally in a very good way, to debate as we are doing and digest and consider and then make decisions based on, on a process which may take many months, many years, a shift in culture, um, a shift in expectation, legal premise that, that gives the police and, uh, you know, and other areas a, a way of acting differently. We, we don't have that luxury at the moment. And I think everybody would reflect on the fact that we've not done things in a way that we would like to do or we would, we would normally do. And I, you know, I, I don't know all the facts, but I think my view would be, let's be cautious about you know, 
run into a situation where maybe we've got to make wholesale changes and, and tear up the, the, the handbook. You know, was it right before? Probably not. But was a lot of it right? Yes. And is it moving in the right direction? I hope so. But as we've all said, our experiences, some people would say yes, some people say I'm not sure, and some people say no, we're not moving in the right direction or we're not moving quickly enough. I don't know because I don't know enough about other people's experiences. And I think we've got to be tolerant of this situation as well that we find ourselves in. And I think people have, have, have publicly reflected on that. I think Danny's point about the, the media, you know, it's a story, isn't it? To, to say, look, you know, this demonstration has done this and it's because of that. Um, but when you actually unpick it all, actually, why was there conflict? Why was there difficulty? Well, actually, because we've got laws in place because of COVID that really don't allow us to to reflect and perhaps demonstrate and protest on really important things in a way that we would like to. And, and ultimately, is it possible for the two to come together in the right way? And I would suggest that's probably quite difficult at the moment. Thank you, Russell, that's very helpful. We, we're coming into that period of, uh, of these debates where there will be a summing up. So uh, in just a moment, I'm gonna invite Louise and then Russell and then Danny, Danny to um, do their closing remarks. Just a, a thought listening on to everything that's been said, um, that there is, um, uh, if we look at the end of World War II, there is often a season in a nation's history where on the back end of a crisis, there is a reflection and potentially even a, a reinvention of some institutions and the frameworks and a, and a responding and a redefining of the culture that comes on the back end of some of those major crises, because people's priorities get so transformed and affected by the, the crisis itself. So uh, some of what we're witnessing and even these debates themselves are bearing testimony to an appetite for change, uh, a, a need for change, and also in some senses, the redefining of what that change is going to be. And, and um, for me, I, I will reach my old age by the time those institutions are well and truly underway and that change is part of everyday life but um, for, for, for some, they, they've got the excitement of living in that world as well to come. So, um, so just um, some closing remarks then from Louise and then Russell and then finally Danny. Thank you. Thank you um, for inviting me into this space. I've really appreciated being, to, being able to talk to you. I think my closing remarks will be kind of thinking about the urgency and what pace we can make change and thinking of short-term but also long-term change and we, we know as a nation that we do need reform in lots of areas but how we can support that by using lived experience but not just using it and taking it and not listening to it but really supporting those voices and showing allyship and reading about those experiences that you know might not necessarily be our own and learning how we can be in that space supporting those voices and if we're hearing something that is uncomfortable we don't agree with how we can support that further and what other things we can do to support our friends our family but generally the wider society and how do we as a nation change and, and using the tools we've learned in this pandemic and some of the resilience we have in, we have developed in this really traumatic time but also the, the images we have seen we've seen um, the death of so many people of colour and how do we use that and that emotion that we have seen and make it into a better society, not just for them, but for everyone else. And that is my closing remarks. Lovely, Louise, thank you. Uh, Russell. Sir. Thank you. And, and like Louise, um, it's such a privilege to, to join you all this afternoon. And, and, and as an educator, it, it, it does, I think in my mind, the most important thing, which is get me thinking, uh, more about the responsibility I have educating young people. Uh, we, when we write reports, we have uh, www, what went well, and EBI, even better if. And I come out of these uh, discussions, actually particularly the one today, thinking you know, about my responsibility as an educator and even better if, you know, what can I do you know, in my privileged position to, to improve the discussion, the dialogue, the, the increase the pace of change. I mean, one of the things that we saw, I think so vividly uh, before the pandemic was about the environmental side of things. And it was driven by young people. And, and whilst there was a bit of me always kind of reflecting on, I don't like the fact that the children are missing school. I was deeply proud of the conviction that they had to want to go and get their voice heard to facilitate a speedier change to you know, the climate issue. 
Uh, and it, I guess one of the many downsides of this pandemic is that that discussion has softened, hasn't it? I mean, we, we're not, you know, there's a real momentum around the environmental discussion, and I don't want to go into that now. But I think, you know, empowering young people, you know, in the end, they're going to be the people sitting on these discussions and in a few years making decisions, um, you know, to, to help us take the next step as a society. So, you know, I really value these discussions uh, for my own very selfish personal kind of benefits. So thank you. I mean, that's not much of a sum up, but it's a very selfish sum up. So thank you, Gareth. That's very helpful, Russell. Thank you so much. And uh, finally, over to you, Danny. Yeah, thank you very much. Re uh, reiterate those points. Uh, really, really grateful for the opportunity to speak and also the connections that we can make through these things. I think th these are the, the, the sort of um, conversations we should be having. It has to start somewhere and perhaps this has to be, this is at the first point. Um, I agree with everything that's been said so far. But what I would also say is there will always be people that will seek to exploit the good nature uh, that we've and, and the and the trust that we we seek to try and um, build between our communities and the various parts of our communities. We always talk about um, the, the notion of the police with ethics about what would the public expect. And the difficult that is is well, it depends which member of the public you speak to. Um, you know, do people? Do people generally feel safe with with more police? Well, it depends who you are, uh, and I can understand why some people would and some people wouldn't. Uh, there will always be people who will seek to exploit uh, these concerns for their own sort of nefarious gains, uh, whether you like it or not. Um, you know, people talk about defunding the police. We need to make sure that we're we're smart with how we fund the police. Um, you know, we are, whether you like it or not, we are a necessary evil if you want to look at us that way. Um, take the police away and, and see what you get. Can we be better? Yeah, way better. We can do an awful lot better and we should seek to. Um, but those who are involved in protests, many of them have a very, very justifiable cause. And I'm a huge supporter of peaceful protest. Uh, that is the cornerstone of democracy. And as a, a public order commander, public order, public safety commander, is my role partly to make sure that when we do have a protest, everyone gets the chance to have their say, regardless which side you're on. And we are very much in the middle and impartial. There'll be some people that use that as an opportunity for criminality. Uh, they're the same people that are setting fire to police vehicles and throwing petrol bombs at police officers who are uh, sons and daughters, uh, members of the community. They're your members of the community. Uh, they are appearing at the same protests over and again around the country. Uh, their interest is in throwing things and breaking things, not in looking opportunities to build trust, not looking opportunities to, to engage. So stop and search to, to finish it off is, is a valuable tool with that. Um, can it be much better? Yes. Can we be? Uh, can it? Can it contribute positively or negatively to the the police community interaction? Yes. But we are better off with it than without it. Great. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you to all of our panel um, for your valuable contributions. It's been a treat meeting you um, and uh, just hearing the the wealth of the things you have to say. And uh, it really has been a, a very fruitful discussion. Thank you to everybody that came along. Thank you to Ian for facilitating these and uh, very much appreciate the time you've taken today to be with us. Bless you all. And I uh, hope you have a good evening. Thank you all very much. Thank you.